obviously, you know, everything's like very nuanced. You know, if we get up to this level um, and, you know, derivatives is, you know, you're seeing funding decreasing, open interest increasing, you know, maybe that's a you know sign that we're probably going to squeeze up to about 52, 53 area. So I'm, I'm kind of just playing it level to level, but these are the levels that I have drawn out that I think are kind of most important for now. Hey, welcome back everybody to Altcoin Daily. My name's Austin, here with Aaron, joined by friend of the channel and on-chain analyst, Will Clemente. Man, thanks for joining us. Hey guys, appreciate you having me back on. It's been too long. Yes, dude. And yeah, absolutely. And since then, you have started your own YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, I have a channel called Blockware Intelligence. Uh, we do different podcasts with people like, uh, we've had Willy Woo, Plan B, uh, Michael Saylor on, some of the bigger Bitcoin names. Um, and then as well as I just started this on-chain analysis educational series where I'm walking through some, uh, you know, surface level on-chain stuff. We'll kind of progress into more advanced stuff over time, but uh, we've done three episodes so far. So yeah, I don't want to get too shilly, but you know, anyone who uh, wants to check that out, feel free. Links. Go ape into his YouTube channel. If you get in before 10,000 subscribers, you're getting in early, early stages. Appreciate well, it. one thing, uh, the links to your Twitter and YouTube channel are down below. One thing that I always find is I can't get enough of the on-chain data. I wish more people were talking about it. So I'm glad you started the channel. Well, can I just say, Will is more than just an on-chain analyst. That was on his Twitter forever. That's why everybody <laughs> calls him an on-chain analyst. But let's be clear, he is an analyst. <laughs> Thanks, man. You must have, you must have seen my tweet, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think um, you know, I think on chain was definitely like what I was known for, right? But um, I definitely think like my view of the market has evolved to be a lot more nuanced. I don't think you can look at like one specific thing uh, and to come to you know your broader conclusion of what's going on with the market. I think it's a mix of several different things. And just understanding how to kind of, you know, um, bring those things together, mesh them together uh, to kind of give you this best, like overall structural view of what's going on. I think on-chain's a piece in that, but um, especially when open interest is so high, as we'll look at in a second, I think uh, derivatives data is extremely important in times like now. Let's just jump right in. Take us to the chart that's most relevant to us or wherever you want to start off with. Sure. I just went ahead and uh, shared my screen. I can see it. All right, cool. So what we're looking at here is open interest relative to market cap. So let's break that down. So open interest is telling you the amount of open futures contracts in the perpetual swap market. So perps are, or perps are short for perpetual swaps um, are the most liquid product in the Bitcoin market. And also the, I give you like access to cheap leverage. You know, this is where you can go and do like 125 X leverage on Binance or whatever. Um, so open interest is telling you the amount of open contracts for perpetual swaps. So it's not telling you, like I often get asked, can you tell me how many longs or how many shorts are open uh, in the perp market? That's not how it works. It's just, you know, there's a contract, there's a person on the long side, there's a person on the short side. Um, and it's just about understanding the risk that e the person on each side of that contract holds. And so like, an example of this would be, let's say there's a, a retail DGEN that's just looking to get access to cheap leverage. They want to go 50, 100x long on Bitcoin for whatever reason. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're on the long side of the contract. And they're obviously taking on substantial risk. On the other side of that contract, you could have a market maker, which market makers are basically paid to fill orders. And they, they get paid by the amount of volume that they transact on each platform. They just get a fee from the exchange. But they're non-directional in nature, right? And that's a term we call delta neutral. So they have no directional bias. At all times, their books are balanced. Their deltas are hedged, just is what the you know, fancy finance term is, is called for that. Um, and so in this case, where we talk about the, you know, the retail degen is on the long side, you have the market maker on the short side, but they might be hedged in spot. So they might be long spot Bitcoin and then short the perp. Um, and so, yes, there's, you know, one person on the long and short side of that contract, but the risk, the risk uh, parameters of both participants is completely different, right? The, the, the person on the long side, in that case, the retail degen is, is taking on a lot more, is taking on a lot more risk. Um, so open interest, again, doesn't tell you, I know I said a lot there, but open interest doesn't tell you how many longs or shorts are in the market. It just tells you how many contracts are built up in the system, how much leverage is in the system. And that's where we get this 
this term open interest. It's telling you how much open in how much interest is is there, excuse me, to be in the perpetual swap market. And so we're taking the amount of contracts in the system, the open interest, relative to market cap. And that's where we get um, the, some people call this metric open interest dominance. So you just call it market cap to open interest ratio. You're just dividing market cap by um, the open interest. And so that's the, that's the blue line you have here. Uh, so like you, maybe you'll ask like, why do that? Why not just look at the raw you know, value of open interest? The reason is because you need to see how large this open interest is relative to the market cap, because let's say, you know, let's say open interest, this is just random numbers. Let's say open interest is at, uh, you know, a hundred million and Bitcoin's market cap is at 250 million. Well, that's a lot more substantial than if open interest is at a hundred million and Bitcoin's market cap is at 1 billion, right? Because it's, you know, it's, it, you know, Bitcoin's market cap in the first example is 2.5 2.5 times larger versus, you know, at a billion, it's 10 times larger. So the, you know, th this basically adjusts open interest for, um, for like how large Bitcoin's market cap is. So like if I pull, if I pull this up, this green line, this is just, this is just open interest in Can I ask you something real quick, yeah. Will? Yeah. I'm familiar with markets in general in the cryptocurrency market. I know about spot buying. Somebody buys, yep. somebody sells, that makes the price. Now what you're telling me here with futures and derivatives and open interest, my question to you is, I guess percentage wise, how much does this factor into the price versus the spot? Right. So this is this is basically what open interest is telling you. So like when open interest is higher, you need to be factoring this in more so. Because the you know the amount of the amount of futures activity is larger relative to market cap. Whenever whenever it's down, like right here, like for example, you know we're looking at mid May, it's it's way lower. So it's telling you that you know the size of the open interest relative to the market cap is much smaller. So you can give more weight to the spot, what's going on in spot. You know, spot has a, a larger influence on the market at that time. Same as here here, um, recently here, right? But currently we're way up on this metric, up in this, if you were gonna draw like this imaginary kind of zone up here, you know, this like overheated zone or whatever you wanna call it, um, you know, open interest has been hanging out here for several weeks now. It's been two or three weeks up in these areas where previously we've seen a flush. Um, so, you know, in this case, this was a long squeeze. In this case, this was a short squeeze, another long squeeze, another long squeeze, and this is still kind of TBD. Right. We've seen we've seen this slowly grind down a bit, came back up over the last two days, but still we haven't seen any type of flush. I mean, this is a one day movement, you know, one day movement here, uh, a one day movement here and here as well. Right. So I'm still waiting for that kind of major flush in that sense. And a question, um, Will, and when yeah. this flush happens, does that mean the price is going to go down substantially? Right. And so this is where we need to look at other metrics to tell us about the positioning of that open interest. Because again, open interest is just telling you the amount of contracts, not about the positioning. And that's where we can look at things like a funding rate or long short ratios. And then we can also just look at something as simple as how is open interest reacting to price? You know, where's the open interest coming in? Is it coming in as price is moving up? Is it coming in as price is moving down? Uh, how, is it in, how is it interacting with price? You know, if you see Bitcoin sweeping, you know, some lows and you see open interest close out, well, what does that tell you versus, you know, when you see open interest closing as Bitcoin's price is sweeping the highs, right? Uh, so, you know, there's several different things that you can look at, but open interest in itself is just telling you basically like pressure is built up, right? Think about like, uh, this is an analogy I just made up off the top of my head. Like, let's say you have a balloon, right? You blow up the balloon. That's telling you that's the open interest building up. As soon as you let the balloon go and it starts to blow all over the place, that's all based on the, on the positioning in terms of the other metrics we talked about. But no, open interest is just telling you that the balloon is blown up. Well, I get it. And we're, that balloon is getting blown up higher and higher or bigger and bigger, I see, from where we are now. Yes. And, and so we can look at some other things like, uh, again, like funding rate, long short ratio to kind of give us a gauge as to, you know, where that aggression is. We can look at that if you'd like. Uh, let me pull up funding rate. Yeah. Let's so while I'm doing that, I'll talk about these two metrics. So long short ratio is comparing. Will, again, Will for, well, before you go yeah, on, yeah. I, I love being educated, but really when it comes down to it, I want to know if price is going up or down. So I hope we're getting to that. 
Yeah, I wish it was, I wish it was that simple, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one second. I'm just joking around, dude. This is very no, 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 totally, totally, totally. Yeah. So long short ratio is telling you the amount of uh, accounts that are net long relative to net short. So you know, obviously, again, like there's always a long for every short, but long short ratio being high means that there's more accounts that are net long versus accounts that are net short. And generally, you want to fade what the majority is doing, right? You want to fade what the majority, which is mostly retail in most situations, are, is doing. Um, and then this is the other the, this is the other indicator that you can look at to kind of gauge aggression of positioning. This is funding. So funding is telling you the delta or the difference between the weighted average price of, of the spot exchanges and the perpetual swap price. So whenever funding is positive, so whenever it's green on this chart, it's telling you that longs are paying shorts because there's more interest to go long relative to being short generally. But um, green what, bad. What, yes, generally, yeah, generally green green is bad um, because it's telling you that you know the perp price is trading above the spot price, which you, well, you know, healthy rallies are really driven by, by spot uh, or at least initiated by spot rather than, rather than uh, derivatives, which are, you know, when we're talking about perps are, are highly leveraged market participants. Um, and so like, you'll see what, whenever we have a corrective phase, what you want to, what you want to see is like a, a regime, as I call it, of negative funding. So if we look at the recovery after March, 2020, if we look at the recovery after September 2020, we saw a regime of negative funding. We were, you know, what funding was bonkers, you know, throughout early 2021. Obviously, we were in a massive state of euphoria. Um, then came back down, had another regime of negative funding over the summer. You'll see during this corrective phase at the end of September. Um, and then here we started to carve out some negative funding, but overall, we're not, it's not quite as clear as, you know, this, this area that we saw over summer. This was clearly, you know, funding was funding was you know majority negative for this whole period, as well as as it started to grind off these lows. When we zoom in here, as it started to grind off the lows, you saw funding go more negative. So it showed you that spot was really leading this rally, slash the fact that perps were fading the rally, and then eventually we got this big squeeze right here. Um, and so with that being said, I think it's it's a lot more difficult to gauge the positioning based off of funding um, just because you know we haven't had this clear regime as we did you know over summer for example um, you know again we have started to see some negative funding but this isn't quite as bullish of, of a setup as perhaps a summer 2020 so this was a basically uh, you know really high level sophisticated way of saying it could go either way and so with that being said let's look at um, <laughs> let's look at some price action because I think I think um, you know price action is is not more telling, but I think the way you kind of have to approach this right now is you kind of have to set levels for yourself in terms of invalidation, or saying you know if the market reclaims this level, I'd be looking for you know uh, I'd be I'd be claiming that you know momentum has been reclaimed, um, just because the future setup isn't explicitly clear, at least from from my perspective. Uh, and so with that in mind. Uh, I think the most important level remains to be this 40K level when we zoom out. Uh, you know, I think, first of all, we're just in this giant range between 30 and 60, but 40 is kind of that point of control for the middle of the range. And it's kind of where price is interacted with the most and kind of been this key pivot point for market structure and from like a higher time frame perspective, like a broader perspective. Uh, and so I did start, I, I bought like two weeks ago around 41K. I'm still sitting on those spot buys. Um, and I'm looking for, I'm looking for, you know, this area to perhaps, uh, get tapped for my first TP on that, uh, as well as this 52 area. But I think if you're talking about, you know, looking for momentum to be reclaimed, I think this is the first level, uh, around, you know, 45, 46. And then if you're a bit more conservative, um, this 53 area, I think this 53 area is kind of that pivotal point for high time frame momentum to be reclaimed. Um, I, you know, for, for these buys that I made two weeks ago, they're really just kind of a play on mean reversion for kind of a bounce up to this area. And then I think kind of at the highest that this area, that's my base case that we probably set some kind of macro, uh, lower high at these levels. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll see how the derivative setup goes when we get, you know, how it looks when we get there, obviously, you know, everything's like 
very nuanced. You know, if we get up to this level um, and, you know, derivatives is, you know, you're seeing funding decreasing, open interest increasing, you know, maybe that's a you know sign that we're probably going to squeeze up to about 52, 53 area. So I'm, I'm kind of just playing it level to level, but these are the levels that I have drawn out that I think are kind of most important for now. And um, if we can't hold 40,000, 40, where's the next support? Um, I mean, I think for now, my, my base case is that 40 is cheap. I think if we start closing below 40, that then kind of gives you the, the, the market is telling you that 40 is then expensive. And in that case, I think I would kind of just resort back to this massive range that we're in between 30 and 60. I think that kind of really gives validation to that thesis if we start closing below 30. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think like buying that initial retest of 40, which is essentially what I did. I missed it by like, uh, like by like one grand, uh, you know, I think it also just offers you really clear invalidation to your point is like, you know, if we start closing below 40, that gives you a clear, you know, signal to say, Hey, maybe I'm going to step out of this trade. It, you know, my idea for the trade has been invalidated, but I think, you know, on a, on the initial retest of this really important macro level, you know, I think after, you know, seeing down only for two months, I think at least expecting some mean reversion in the short term, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that's unreasonable at all to, to be expecting that. It's just, I think from a high time for like a high time frame perspective, when we talk about, you know, what, what I just mentioned is a lower time frame opinion. Like when we talk about higher time frames, I, I still think, you know, you were, it's definitely prudent to be cautious until the 53 area is reclaimed. So, you know, if you're just someone who's looking to know, like, you know, are we going to, are we going to, you know, perhaps resume the bull, the bull market, if you will, you know, that would be that 53 area that I would kind of be looking at to, to gauge that. I, you know, the other thing is we're really, um, we're correlating to equities really strongly right now, especially the NASDAQ. Um, and so like, I think until either, I think until either you see a rebound in TradFi, which is traditional finance, um, or if we start, or if we have some type of catalyst from Bitcoin that kind of knocks us out of that correlation, I think we're probably just, you know, at the mercy of what happens in TradFi. And so, you know, we've had this um, kind of monetary tightening, uh, you know, tone coming from the Fed. They still haven't done anything, but they're talking about they're going to do three rate hikes in 2022. Uh, Jamie Dimon was saying they're going to do six or seven or something like that. You know, I think it's key to understand they still haven't done anything yet, but, um, you know, flip the camera as we talk about this. Sure. If you would. Yeah, yeah, one sec. Because this is valuable stuff, and I just want to make sure we have the clean visual. So you're sure, saying, yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I just, I, I just didn't realize what you're saying when you said flip the camera first. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a blonde moment. Um, yeah, with with equities, you know, we're we're correlating really strongly. So unless unless Bitcoin has some kind of catalyst that can knock it out of that correlation, or we start to see you know equities rebounding, I think we're still caught up in that in that correlation with them. Um, and and you know, a lot of that's just dependent on uh, monetary conditions. So I think, you know, the kind of like 50 IQ trade of last year, which is saying, hey, look, the Fed is continuing to inject liquidity into the market. And so all asset prices are going to go up. And we saw that, you know, it, as my buddy uh, Travis Kling likes to say, it was, it's all one trade, right? It's just, you know, by owning Bitcoin last year, you were just going out further on the risk curve in that sense. Um, and so I think it's very nuanced discussion as to your opinion of how far can the Fed go with monetary tightening. But I do think it's safe to say that, um, you know, until we, until we either have a catalyst that knocks us out of that correlation for Bitcoin, and I'm not sure, you know, what that may be, it could be potentially like, you know, the Bitcoin bond getting oversubscribed to as, you know, some of the domino effect that maybe come out, can come out of that. I think that would be a, a strong catalyst. Maybe, you know, maybe we see a spot Bitcoin ETF, you know, it would have to be some type of catalyst to knock us out of that correlation or else we're probably just susceptible to correcting with equities until we start to see monetary conditions ease up again. And you know, that, that all roots out of inflation, right? So part of the reason that Bitcoin and equities have been, you know, correcting for the last month or so is because markets are forward looking. And so uh, when we have, you know, inflation is good in moderation, but when it gets to extremes, like we've seen over the last month with these massive CPI prints, you know, CPI at the highest it's been in 40 years, which is the consumer price index for maybe listeners who don't know, um, you know, that, that basically puts the pressure on the Fed and just the government to at least make a stance that they're combating inflation, especially with midterms coming up at the end of the year. Uh, in November, you know, Biden's approval ratings are way down. Uh, it's just not a great look, um, you know, for the current uh, administration. So they need to kind of at least appear that they're taking a stance 
against, um, you know, these inflationary forces. And so again, like, I think once you start to see those really high CPI prints, I think Bitcoin actually topped out on, uh, on like the initial CPI print that shocked a lot of people. Um, and that was just because markets are forward looking. So they're saying if inflation is getting out of hand, well, then we can probably expect monetary tightening in the next couple months. Uh, and then you started to see the Fed coming in, uh, starting to talk about doing three rate hikes next year. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's what really that, that's what it's going to take to kind of break out of this correlation with equities. Let me ask you something, Will. So uh, some of the things you said was that at the moment, 39K, 40K might be a buy. But if it breaks that, then we need to consider bouncing around between 30 and 40K. My question to you is, number one, big question. Well, what if we're in a bear market? I guess that's one question. And the other question is, on the flip side, would you say that Bitcoin never goes below 30K again? Yeah, I think, I think saying never is, you know, really difficult because I think like, you know, before like the COVID dump, you probably would have said Bitcoin was never going to go below 6K or whatever at the time. So I'm going to like, I'll veer away from that. I'll say, I think it's unlikely, but it's definitely possible. Um, and then um, like, you know, in, in terms of like, will, will we go below 30 K? I, I do still think like we're kind of in that macro range, uh, you know, between like 30 and 60 call it. Um, what was it? What was the first question? I've, I just went over my head. I forgot. Will, I'm coming to you, man, because I want you to be straight with me. Are yeah. we in a bear market? Oh, okay. My fault. Um, yeah, I think like the bull bear market thing, I think like we have basically been projecting the past onto the future, right? Instead of trying to think like, what does the future look like? Uh, I think like now that Bitcoin is like a legitimate macro asset, you know, we have a, a much tighter correlation to equities and equities kind of have this upwards, you know, upwards uh, grind to them, right? We're not going to see, I think, as much volatility with Bitcoin as we have seen as it kind of matures and you see a new type of kind of market participants in the, in the, in the market. So like, uh, you know, like part of the, the double-edged sword of, of having institutions is everyone thought, you know, institutions are going to diamond hand Bitcoin up to, you know, a million dollars a coin. The other end of that is that, you know, um, you're going to see like tighter correlations to what happens in traditional finance, just because that's how these people are thinking. And that's how they're balancing their portfolios and managing their balance sheets is, you know, with what's going on in traditional finance in mind versus historically Bitcoin's just been a you know, retail driven asset. So uh, kind of TLDR is that I think we probably see these more rounded tops and bottoms with Bitcoin until, um, in, until we see some kind of blow off top. That would be like being, that would be my invalidation for that is that we continue to kind of see these, um, you know, lower volatility, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, rounded bottoms and rounded tops until we see some kind of, you know, major blow off top uh, at that point, then I would think we see like a prolonged bear market. But, you know, I think we need to kind of also define like, what is a bull market? What is a bear market? Are we defining that by price drawdown? Are we defining that by, you know, transactional activity on the blockchain like if we're defining it by that we've been in a bear market since may of last year so you know i think it's we need to think about like what what are we calling a bull and bear market and then as well as like um you know should you just be expecting that what, what's happened in the past and especially when we talk about like these four-year cycles should we be expecting that moving forward uh, i tend to think that the answer is probably no um and you know at some point even if i'm wrong about you know the next couple of years i mean at some point the, uh, the four-year cycle is going to break down. Uh, I tend to think that it's probably closer than further away because of the type of market participants that we now have that are dominating the market being traditional finance. Will, thank you so much for sharing the charts, sharing your perspective. To the folks at home, the Altcoin Daily audience, would you just give a final summation, final thoughts for all those Bitcoin holders out there? Sure. I think, you know, if you're a long-term investor, just, you know, sit tight and hodl. Uh, I think once we get through these, uh, you know, monetary tightening conditions, whether that be, you know, a few months or potentially into the end of the year until after midterms, you know, I, I don't think there's anything that changes the uh, broader Bitcoin thesis, even if they marginally, you know, do raise interest rates. You know, the general trend of rates is down over, call it the next five, 10 years. And that's you know, extremely bullish for Bitcoin. Uh, and yeah, aside from that, you know, traders uh, kind of gave some of the levels I'm personally looking at. Uh, but yeah, uh, for long-term investors, just hold on, sit tight. I think at this point, if you haven't de-risked, you know, for macro purposes at, you know, 60K, it's kind of 
in my opinion, silly to start getting worried about that now at 40. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, sell because of macro, you would have done that two months ago, not now. I think whenever you have, you know, everyone talking about a narrative, that narrative is probably reaching saturation and you're getting ready to kind of pivot to that next narrative um, as you're talking about, as, as everyone's talking about the next one. Um, and so I think like at this point you see like everyone on crypto Twitter is everyone's a macro economics expert and everyone's telling you about the fed and everything. And uh, maybe I sound a little hypocritical as a kid talking about that myself, but um, you know, I think, I think when everyone's talking about something that generally it means that, uh, you know, you're probably getting due for a, a narrative shift uh, pretty soon. So that's, that's what I'll say. It's a question of, you know, how much of this is priced in, right? And I, I, gen I generally think that more of it is priced in than not at this point. Will, give us a price prediction. <laughs> I'm good, guys. I'm going to be A 2022 away. price prediction, dude? Uh, I, I screwed myself away. I'll say, I'll say, um, I'll say between... 25k and 150k hey i love it dude you didn't <laughs> bitch out and say 100k like everybody dude i love it appreciate it i you know i just uh i think it's just like when we talk about a year away it's just so difficult to predict like all the factors you know i think um you kind of just got to play this level to level in terms of you know you don't know what's gonna happen macro over the next year you got like you know all this shit with like ukraine and russia i don't know if i can curse on here but um you know, oh, yeah, all you these can. different, cool. You know, all these different geopolitical factors. I think it's you know going to be tricky to say what's you know where's Bitcoin's price going to be at exactly in, in a year. I think I think uh, you know you really got to just like look at this level to level and just watch what the market's giving you as as we go. Will, I love the reasonable perspective. Links for Will Clemente down below. That's his YouTube channel and Twitter. Thanks, man. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for uh, having me on and bearing with me through the uh, nasally voice with the COVID here.